We chanced in passing by that afternoon to catch it in a sort of special picture, among tar-banded ancient cherry trees set well back from the road in ranked lodge grass. The little cottage we were speaking of, a front with just a door between two windows, fresh painted by the shower, velvet black. We paused, the minister and I, to look. He made as if to hold it at arm's length, or put the leaves aside that framed it. Pretty. Come in. No one will care. The path was a vague parting in the grass that led us to a weathered window sill. We pressed our faces to the pane. You see, everything's as she left it when she died. Her sons won't sell the house or the things in it. They say they mean to come in summer here where they were boys. They haven't come this year. They live so far away. One is out west. It will be hard for them to keep their word. Anyway, they won't have the place disturbed. A buttoned haircloth lounge spread scrolling arms under a crayon portrait on the wall, done sadly from an old daguerreotype. That was the father as he went to war. She always, when she talked about war, sooner or later came and leaned, half knelt against the lounge beside it, though I doubt if such unlifelike minds kept power to stir anything in her after all the years. He felt like Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. I ought to know, it makes a difference which. Fredericksburg wasn't Gettysburg, of course. But what I'm getting to is how forsaken our little cottage this has always seemed. Since she went, more than ever. But before. I don't mean altogether by the lies that had gone out of it. The father first, then the two sons thought she was left alone. Nothing could draw her after those two sons. She valued the considerate neglect she had at some cost taught them after years. I mean by the world's having passed it by as we almost got by this afternoon. It always seems to me a sort of mark to measure how far fifty years have brought us. Why not sit down if you're in no haste? These doorsteps seldom have a visitor. The warping boards pull out their own old nails with none to tread and put them in their place. She had her own idea of things, the old lady, and she liked to talk. She had seen Garrison and Whittier and had her story of them. One wasn't long in learning that she thought whatever else the Civil War was for, it wasn't just to keep the states together, nor just to free the slaves, though it did both. She wouldn't have believed those ends enough to have given outright for them all she gave. Her giving somehow touched the principle that all men are created free and equal. And to hear her quaint phrases, so removed from the world's view today of all those things, that's a hard mystery of Jefferson's. What did he mean? Of course, the easy way is to decide it simply isn't true. It may not be. I heard a fellow say so. But never mind, the Welshman got it planted, but it will trouble us a thousand years. Each age will have to reconsider it. You couldn't tell her what the West was saying and what the South to her serene belief. She had some art of hearing and yet not hearing the latter wisdom of the world. White was the only race she ever knew. Black she had scarcely seen, and yellow never. But how could they be made so very unlike by the same hand working in the same stuff? She had supposed the war decided that. What are you going to do with such a person? Strange how such innocence gets its own way. I shouldn't be surprised if in this world it were the force that would at last prevail. Do you know, but for her, there was a time when to please younger members of the church, or rather say non-members in the church whom we all have to think of nowadays i would have changed the creed a very little not that she ever had to ask me not to it never got so far as that but the bare thought of her old tremulous bonnet in the pew and of her half asleep was too much for me why i might wake her up and startle her it was the words descended into hades that seemed too pagan to our liberal youth you know they suffered from a general onslaught and, well, if they weren't true, why keep right on saying them like the heathen? We could drop them. Only there was the bonnet in the pew. Such a phrase couldn't have meant much to her. But suppose she had missed it from the creed as a child misses the unsaid good night and falls asleep with heartache. How should I feel? I'm just as glad she made me keep hands off, for, dear me, why abandon a belief merely because it ceases to be true? Cling to it long enough, and not a doubt it will turn true again, for so it goes. Most of the change we think we see in life is due to truths being in and out of favor. As I sit here, and oftentimes I wish I could be monarch of a desert land, I could devote and dedicate forever to the truths we keep coming back and back to. 
So desert it would have to be, so walled by mountain ranges half in summer snow, no one would covet it or think it worth the pains of conquering to force change on. Scattered oases where men dwelt, but mostly sand dunes held loosely in tamarisk blown over and over themselves in idleness. Sand grains should sugar in the natal dew, the babe born to the desert, the sandstorm retard mid-waste my cowering caravans. Oh, there are bees in this wall. Fierce heads looked out, small bodies pivoted. We rose to go. Sunset blazed on the windows.